Second Corinthians chapter eight. Second Corinthians chapter eight. The thought this morning is though he was rich, yet became he poor. You can also call this message, Oh, what a Savior. Second Corinthians eight and nine. Paul is, is he's writing here to the Corinthian church. He's given them the example of the prior verses to this, of this, of the great love that the churches of Macedonia had for him, right? Their great sacrificial love in which they gave Paul a blessing, you know, uh, in his life. And so he's telling them here, but he's, he's for, he's looking, he's using that example, but he, then he's going to bring them to the ultimate example of sacrificial love, which is what we want everyone as the Lord's New Testament church. We want everyone to hear this message. Everyone needs to hear the message of Jesus Christ, right? That's why we are upon this earth to bring the message of Jesus Christ to the lost, right? To, and to grow in grace and then grow in knowledge. But in, a, in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse number 9, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that through his poverty might, that ye through his poverty might be rich. Though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, that ye through his poverty, might be rich. And with that, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our most kind, gracious Heavenly Father, as we come before you at this time, I thank you for your love and for your mercy. I pray, Father, that you'll forgive me as I stand before you. I pray that the Holy Spirit will work in the midst of the church this morning, and that the hearts will be touched, and that um, lives will be changed for you. I pray, Father, that you'll just be with each of us as we hear your word this morning as you know the message that you have for us. I pray, Father, that we'll just open our hearts and our minds to you to allow the Holy Spirit to work in our lives. We thank you for this church in Lancaster, Father, that you, you've blessed and we pray that you'll continue to bless. We pray for the prayer request that's before us. We pray that you'll just raise up to help those that need help, that you'll just comfort those that need comfort, and that you'll stir the hearts and the minds of those who've decided not to come to your house this morning various reasons. I pray, Father, that you will just talk to them through your word this morning. And I pray that you'll just uh, lift up our hearts and our minds to you to focus upon your word, to, to cut out the distractions around us, that we'll just be able to understand what you would have for us. And I pray that you'll use me as an instrument to proclaim your truth. I thank you for your love and for your mercy, and I thank you for your word. Pray that you'll just watch over us as we give you the honor and the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. For you know the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. So in looking at these verses this morning, we can see the lovely Jesus. And we know that many pages of his written word is filled with his loveliness. Remember the words of Solomon in the Song of Solomon, chapter 5, verse number 16. That's in the Old Testament after the book of Ecclesiastes. Song of Solomon 5, 16. This is a description that's used for the shepherd that's talked about in... Uh, His mouth is most sweet, yea, he is all together lovely. This is my beloved, this is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. We know through the word of God, reading from Genesis to Revelation, that Jesus is all together lovely. Right? He is all together lovely. Not in physical appearance or any other worldly attributes that would make 
of him desirous, but in the fact that he was and that he is the Son of God. Isaiah, in fact, tells us in, in chapter 53 that there was nothing in him that we should desire him. And we'll look into that in a moment in greater detail, but as a child of God, we can understand the loveliness of Jesus Christ as Savior. See, our text verse shows us that Christ was in the beginning with God, right? Though he was rich. Right? Showing us the time when all the glory of heaven was upon him. We know through John chapter 1, in verse number 1, that in 1 and 2, that he was with God, right? The word was with God and the word was God. We also find that though he was rich, for your sake, right? for my sake, for the sake of this world that God so loved, Christ became poor. That we, in our poverty, right? that poverty is a, uh, a, a look at sin, in our sin, we might be made rich through Jesus Christ. See, he came down to this low ground of sin and sorrow, taking on him the poverty of our sin nature. Not that he had sin. Now don't get me wrong. The word of God clearly states that he knew no sin. But I want to go to the book of Hebrews. Chapter 2. Verse number 14. See we find that he took part of the same. And this is important because if you, without this, we have no kinsman redeemer. Right? We have no kinsman redeemer. Because one of the requirements of the kinsman redeemer was that they had to be related to the person that they were redeemed. They were redeeming. And because of these great verses, because Jesus became poor for our sake, we now have a faithful and merciful high priest, which we continue on in the book of Hebrews, we read, but for the sake of the message this morning, verse 14, Hebrews 2, 14, for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and of blood, as we are flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil. See, this he did so we could be enriched with his greatness and his love. Verse 17 of the same chapter. Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren. That he might be a merciful and a faithful high priest in things pertaining to God. To make reconciliation for the sins of God the people. And this should make us shout oh what a savior. None of this is deserved on our behalf. Solomon said that he was altogether lovely. But Isaiah said that there was no beauty. In Isaiah chapter 53 and verse number 2 Isaiah 53 and 2 For he shall grow up before him a, as a tender plant, as a root out of dry ground. He hath no form. Excuse me. Nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. So what we see here that he didn't have an impressive form or a majesty or majesty that we should look upon. No appearance that we should desire him. So when we say he is altogether lovely and that he has no beauty, those two are very true. They speak of the same Jesus. He is altogether lovely. But there was nothing about him as he came into this low ground of sin and shame. 
that man should desire him. Because he will find that death. We'll get to there in a minute regarding his comeliness. The word comeliness, by the way, means splendor. His majesty. What did he do with his majesty and his splendor? The book of Philippians tells us that he set it aside. And we'll get there in a minute. I'm, I'm getting ahead of my message. <laughs> what we must understand from this is that the truly, that to the truly born again, I almost said to the truly being born again child of God, but that's a redundant statement. Because if you're truly born again, then you're a child of God, right? I don't know of any uh, unsaved children of God in that aspect. But anyway, to the truly born again, Jesus is altogether lovely. But to those without Jesus, who do not believe that he is the Son of God, there is no beauty to be desired. That is how the majority of people saw Jesus in his day. Again, the prophetic word, and that, that, just by saying that statement there gets some people's antennas up. Prophetic word, oh, what's he going to say now? The prophetic word of Isaiah, right, says that there was nothing in him that would be desired to be looked upon. You know, why did the people follow Jesus? A majority of them. To see miracles, to see the things that he did. And what was the purpose of those miracles? To show forth that he was the son of God. So they didn't truly understand who Jesus was. Some people just thought he was a prophet. Right? Even Nicodemus, who came to Jesus by night, knew he was from God, but he didn't understand the fullness of Jesus, and Jesus laid it out for him. So Jesus is all together. See, the, the word from Isaiah clearly showed that Jesus was Christ. Right? Jesus was Christ. Jesus was the Messiah. He was the anointed one. See, none of these terms that we've talked about is altogether lovely or the beauty in any of that aspect are, are about his outward looks. Right? But they weren't about his outward looks. He was, he was just a man outwardly. But Jesus is lovely in his love, in his kindness, in his mercy, and in his truth, and in his sacrifice. See, none of those things appeal to the lost soul. They have no spiritual eye from which to see the beauty of the Lord of glory. In Isaiah 53, the same chapter, we find, as Isaiah continues on, he is despised, right? The statement for this, there is no beauty that they should desire him, that we should desire him. See, Isaiah put himself in the same category. You know, it's very easy for preachers sometimes to say, you and, and, and they... But really, isn't it not we? We. The word of God is written to we. Now, some people choose not to obey the word of God, and then that's to their own ruin and destruction. But verse 53, he is despised and rejected of men. A man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Didn't acknowledge. You know, many men and women of Jesus' day did not acknowledge him as Christ. Just as today, many people do not acknowledge Jesus as Christ. But the word of God says in our text, ye know the grace of our Lord. As he was talking to those people at Corinth. They knew because they had been born again. And when you've been born again, you know the beauty of Jesus Christ. See, they had experienced salvation by grace. Because of the love and the mercy and the truth of God. That is how any of us receive salvation is by grace. Because of God's mercy. Because of his love. Not on our own merits. And I'm so thankful that it's not on my merits as being a good person. Because 
I don't measure up to God's standard of perfection. I don't, no one does. Thanks be to the Lord Jesus Christ. We can even stand before God. In Ephesians chapter 3. See, what Paul, Paul understood all this. As he told the Ephesians in Ephesians 3 and 8. Unto me, who am least, who, sorry, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of God. See, what's in, what are those riches? Well, the fullness of the Godhead was one of them. All the divine glories and perfection which dwelt in Jesus. The fullness of the grace to pardon, to save, and to sanctify sinners. Of which, you know, Paul right here, he felt that he was the least. Right? He, uh, of the saints, he felt he was the greatest of the sinners. He felt, I am the chief of sinners. Because he understood what he had did in his life where he had persecuted the church. But he understood the grace of God in his life. Going to Colossians chapter 2, verse number 9. Let's look at the words of Paul. Colossians 2 and 9. For in him that is in Christ dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. He's the head of all rule and authority. In whom also ye are circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. And putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Buried with him in baptism. Wherein also ye are risen with him though through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. And you... Being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all your trespasses, blotting out the handwriting, handwriting of ordinances against us, that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross, and having spoiled principalities, that word spoiled, by the way, is a word that means disarmed, taking their power away. Principalities and power hath made a show of them openly, triumphing over them. So this is indeed what Solomon was writing about. And what Isaiah was saying the lost could not see was that the greatness, the fullness of Jesus Christ as he became poor for our sake. Right. So that he is altogether lovely. See, Jesus came down from his heavenly home to live among men only to be rejected and despised. See, our text says, though he was rich, when was he rich? We know that when he was uh, with the Father. When he was in the presence of the Father, as we read in, in Philippians chapter 2, we see something that's very important as, as, as a... I almost got into this earlier. Philippians 2, 6 and 8. Who being in the form of God. Sorry, verse 6. 2 and 6. 6, 2. I think I missed that. I'm not sure. Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. But made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men 
And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. This is what Jesus Christ has done for you and for me. Though he was rich, yet became he poor. See, it says Jesus who existed, right, in the form of God, who being in the form of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be used for his own advantage, right? And he emptied himself. He made himself of no reputation. The, the, the King James uses the word robbery. That word robbery has the thought of a treasure to be clutched and retained at all costs. You know, something that to be hold on. See, Jesus did not consider, you know, not giving up his splendor for you and I. He did it for our behalf. He made himself of no reputation. The Bible says that he willingly weighed all rights to take on him the form of his brethren, which we find in Hebrews chapter 2, verse number 17. He emptied himself. Now, don't misunderstand me. He did not empty himself of his deity. Right? Or his divine nature. Or his attributes. But he had stripped himself of his insignia of majesty. The comeliness that was talked about in Isaiah. We're told in our text that he humbled himself. First he humbled himself as the son, as the, as the, as God the son. And now we see that him humbling himself as the son of man to become the son of man. And as that he humbled himself to death. Meaning that even though he was the master of death, he became obedient to death. Or to the point of death. Then we know through the word of God. He, he dismissed his spirit. Right? Because the word of God says that. In John chapter 10 verse number 18. See men did not kill Jesus. He was on the cross. As part of God's plan. He allowed himself. And that's what it means. He became obedient unto death. Even the death of the cross. So, because in John chapter 10, verse number 18, he told them there, no man taketh it from me. And what's he talking about? His life. He says, but I lay it down myself. He says, I have the power to lay it down. And I have the power to take it again. This is the commandment I have I received from my father. So that is what it means when it says, yet for your sakes, he became poor. He tasted death for every man. Hebrews chapter 2, again, verse number 9. See, the book of Hebrews is written to the Hebrews which were having a hard time. Some people worship angels, some people worship, you know, the prophets and all these things, but... The writer of the book of Hebrews was letting them know that Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is the, is the better covenant, better things. But in Hebrews chapter 2, verse number 9, this is what he wrote. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. So that's what it means in the book of John chapter 3, in verse number 16, when it says, For God so loved the world. Again, I've told you before how much that verse means to me. Right? And as I was growing up, I... I you know, I've said many times, that verse was, was in the Bible, I knew it was in the Bible, but I did not understand the fullness of what that verse meant. For God so loved the world. Think about that, Steve. Why did he love the world? You ever ask yourself that? Why did he love me? Because you are his creation. He loves his creation. 
You know, he doesn't want anyone to perish according to the word of God. See, <laughs> we know that he's uh, not slack concerning his promises, though. But he wants all men to repent. So therefore, we find that Jesus came and he made himself a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. That he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. See, he drank that bitter cup of Calvary. And it was filled with the sin of the world and the wrath of God against sin. Because we're also told in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, a very, another one of the key verses of scripture that means so much to me. You know, this verse of scripture in, in 2 Corinthians 5, 21 shows us that Jesus was uh, capable, that's, that's the wrong word, he was the only one able to pay for my sin. Right? He was the only one worthy. He was the only one that could make atonement for my sin. The reason we know that because when you look back in the Old Testament, the lamb that was slain for the atonement of sin was a lamb that was without blemish, right? It was a lamb that was without spot. Nothing, no markings whatsoever on it. That was a picture of the unblemished Jesus Christ. The lamb that was slain, right? As the book of Peter tells us, the, the, we're, we're redeemed by the blood of Jesus as a lamb without blemish, the lamb of God. But in this person's message, this passage of scripture, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. See, that showed his innocence. Jesus did not know sin. But God made him to be sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So my question this morning, can you say without a shadow of a doubt, oh, what a savior. See, our text says that through his, that ye through his poverty might be rich. See, the wealth of a child of God is not measured in dollars. It's not measured in possessions. That's how the world views wealth, right? And success. But the wealth for a child of God is having Jesus as your Savior. So we're made rich through His poverty. See, it's a Savior who loved us. And wash this in his own precious blood. Thereby making an atonement to God for our sin. And now as we stand covered in the blood. We can stand before God as our father. Clean and washed because of our Savior. Christ says to those that are his. Because I live, ye shall live also. See, the saved, the children of God, are looking for a city which has foundations whose builder and maker is God. I wish all the saved were looking for that. Some people that are saved seem to be doing their own thing. That's not how God would have for his people to live. That's a whole other message. The message this morning is that Jesus is the Savior. And if you do not understand that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the earth, nothing else matters. Church membership doesn't matter if you're not saved. You know, if you're on a roll of some book or some church, if you do not have Jesus Christ as your Savior, nothing else matters. Because without Jesus as your Savior, you will spend eternity in hell. But God doesn't want that. 
Which is why we preach this message. It's why we say this morning, even though he was rich, for your sake, he became poor so that you, in your poverty, could become rich through his grace and through his love. And many, and many times today, it's easy, easy to get troubled in the times in which we live. When it seems that no, very few people want to serve the Lord. People say they're saved, they say they're a child of God, yet they're living the way they want to live. You know, it's not for me to judge people's salvation, but God knows, and ultimately, I believe the individual knows. Because if you don't know, well then that's a problem in and of itself. You need to know in whom you have believed. That's why Paul said, I am persuaded. I am convinced in whom I have believed. And I know that he is able to keep what I have committed to him against that day. So in this time of troubling in which we live, which it's, it's only going to get worse. And as, as the disciples were with Jesus in John chapter 14, we know that they were troubled because Jesus had just told them that he was going to be going away. But he told them something that we today need to understand too. Let not your hearts be troubled. Why? Because I go to prepare a place for you. And I will come again and receive you unto myself. See, there are two things we know for sure as children of God. I should say there are two things that I know for sure and that you need to know for sure too. That is, I know whom I have believed. And two, he is coming again. And in knowing what the Savior is all about, the question is, and the question is always the same when Jesus is preached because you know, when Jesus is preached, even though it's to the, the, the Lord's church, to the congregation this morning, it is to you individually. To what will you do with Jesus Christ? It's always a personal message. What will you do with what you have learned? See, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, according to the word of God. He is the only hope of eternal life. And this is what Paul tells us in Ephesians 1 and 7. In whom we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of sin according to the riches of his grace. Now I want you to continue on and notice what it takes to be saved and to be a child of the king. Ephesians 1 and 12. See, Paul is, is in verse number seven, one of my favorite verses of scripture in the Bible that we just read. See, we have redemption through his gift. Verse 12, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted Christ, in whom ye also trusted. That's the key. After ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation in whom after in whom also after ye believed what happened you were sealed with the holy spirit a promise which is the earnest the earnest is anyone familiar with the earnest wings with there if you've ever bought a house you're familiar with the earnest they got that great term called the earnest money deposit that they want from you. The earnest, the earnest simply means the down payment, the deposit. So the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. See, the word of God is so vast, so deep. And many people strive to just understand all the word of God. And some people do that to the point that they overlook the very basic 
and most important need is that you must be born again. If you have any desire and hope to understand the word of God, you must be born again. You must be a child of God. You must accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. You must come to Him in repentance, putting your faith and trust in His promise that whosoever believeth on the name of the Lord shall be saved. You have to believe what Paul wrote. Not Paul, I'm sorry, I got Paul on the brain. What Peter told to the, the, the Jewish leaders in, in 4 and 12 that Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Now that cuts out everything else. Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the only way to life. And to get to the Father, you must come through Jesus Christ. So this morning, as we have the song leader and the piano player come, as the Holy Spirit is talking to your heart this morning with your need, now is the opportunity that you have to bring your need before the Lord. See, the Lord will meet you where you're at. There's no doubt about that. You can bow your head where you're at. There's something wonderful about taking that first step of humility to come to the altar. Right? Or you're just emptying yourself of your pride and coming and talking to the Lord. There's a beauty in that. But I'm telling you right now, the Lord will meet you where you're at if you call out in sincerity. Because He is a gracious and mercy God. See, we've been sealed according to this, which means a finished transaction, the sign of ownership and the earnest of our inheritance. So can you join me today in saying without a doubt, Oh, what a Savior. If not, why not? As we sing, as we stand.